Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Courtney Hyden, and we are going to be discussing dementia and your money. Courtney and I have had a huge challenge getting together because, as caregivers all know, life is never predictable, and it's we've had to rearrange and reschedule and we finally made it. So thanks for joining me, Courtney. Thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. I'm excited that we finally are able to have this conversation. I'm excited because it's one of the biggest challenges for families when we don't plan ahead, which thankfully my husband and I have. And, you know, it's hard to get a financial planner on the show because You know, people that listen to this two years from now, the information may have changed and their compliance people don't want that. So I am so glad that you reached out and offered to talk to us. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Because I know one of the reasons we've (laughs) had to juggle around caregiving or scheduling is because you're still caregiving for your dad, correct? That is correct. And as many of my followers know, My father was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's at the age of 58 back in 2016. So we're several years into his diagnosis. And he experienced a lot of symptoms much before he was diagnosed. And some of the earliest symptoms of his dementia majorly impacted my parents' finances. And of course, 58 years old is an age where none of us see it coming. I know before my father was diagnosed, We oftentimes thought of Alzheimer's as something that impacted you in your 70s or your 80s. My grandmother passed away with Alzheimer's, but she was in her 80s when this happened. So unfortunately, when my dad was diagnosed, he could no longer work or drive. So of course, 58 is not an age where many of us plan to retire. So this majorly impacted the two of them. I remember sitting at my parents' house. I was in college. We were all watching TV together, and there was a knock on my parents' door. It was a Friday evening. My mom answered, and there was a gentleman on the other side of the door who told her that their house was going to be auctioned off the next day. My mom immediately thought this was a joke, or they certainly had the wrong home. But unfortunately, that was not the case. My father had not made a mortgage payment in nine months. So that hit them like a ton of bricks. She started finding out all kinds of very interesting things that he had been doing. He managed my parents' finances for their entire relationship, not for any reason other than the fact that my mom did not love numbers. My father had a background in finance and held prominent positions for Fortune 50 companies, did tax and accounting services on the side. So... None of us saw this coming, and and this is common with a lot of Alzheimer's diagnoses. Financial decisions start becoming a little bit more difficult. He was hiding mail. So seeing my parents' lack of planning and watching the two of them and our family navigate the financial challenges associated with dementia prompted me to start my own financial planning practice centered around helping families find quality care without going broke in the process. I think Our initial thought is we've got to spend down all of our assets to pay for care, and that's not always the case. So I want to offer hope and a light at the end of the tunnel to families experiencing what mine has. Well, that's kind of how I started the podcast, which my listeners know, but my husband was in banking for 20 years before he became a real estate broker. So your story just, it's like a one-two punch because I can relate to all sides of it. And he does our finances too, because I just can't deal with numbers. It's just not my thing, but I do understand. And, you know, we've had that conversation where it's like, I probably should show you how I, t- I do all these things. And it's like, Ugh. <laughs> so that's yeah. not the best planning on our part, but I could handle it if I had to. Just sure. You know, we've got the passwords for all the accounts are, are locked away, but I know where they're at. It's, it wouldn't be fun, but it wouldn't be impossible. And nobody would be knocking on my door telling me my house was in foreclosure. So, ooh. Yes. Did they, were they able to save the house? Unfortunately not. So it was pretty far in the hole at that point. So it had been nine months since he had made a payment. 
which I think in, in many ways was quite gracious considered, considering most mortgage companies don't tend to wait that long. But it wasn't just that. So he had spent down a lot of their savings, making poor financial decisions. He would stay up late at night and would buy things online, invest in poor investments that may have seemed to him like a good idea, just things that were completely out of character for my father. So when it came time and things started becoming uncovered, it was almost too late and there were not a lot of resources to catch things up. Yikes. That must have just been so much yeah. fun for you. And then you decided you were going to help other people through this kind of charming yeah. problem. So <laughs> more power to yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was definitely, definitely a difficult time. And we are a very close knit family. And, and my brother and I have been very, very supportive of my parents through all of this and, and trying to play as big a role as possible and in, in helping them navigate this. And my mom ended up having to go back to work. She stayed home with my brother and I for the majority of our childhood, raising the two of us. She helped out at our school a lot. But this prompted her to go back to work. Shortly after my dad was diagnosed, he could no longer work and had to resign his position. So again, many financial impacts. And now the time has come where he's not able to stay at home by himself anymore. My mom still is working. So the two of us split the caregiving responsibilities to make sure my dad has what he needs. Which impacts your ability to work. And you have kids Absolutely. too, right? I have one daughter. She's 10 years old. So yes, I am what many consider a big part of the sandwich generation. So yes, raising my daughter and then also helping to care for both of my parents in many ways is, is a huge part of my life. One of the messages I've been trying to get out there more is, and you and I had brief text conversation about this when we were rescheduling again, is how Alzheimer's and other dementias is a huge tidal wave that is going to just crush this country if we don't figure out a way of supporting people like your mom and yourself mm -hmm. and people who move in, you know, millennials that move in with their parents to take care of them, you know, older spouses that have to retire early. I mean, the financial hits are horrendous and I am not in any way saying I think the government should take care of us because no, I don't think I want that option. But yeah. I know people who worked in like schools all their life and they made just enough money to not qualify for Medicaid, Medicaid, it's Medi-Cal Medi in this, in this state. So I get yeah. confused <laughs> and it makes me insane because it's like, you know, we've got, politicians who don't understand that just because you retire early, you know, they don't understand the financial hit, you know, they don't understand the, you know, the 30 somethings that are taking care of a parent and not working when that parent is gone. You're really going to start a career in your forties. My mom had Alzheimer's for 20 years. They might be trying to start a career in their fifties. God forbid. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, we're, it's something we're going to have to address much sooner rather than later, but we don't seem to do that so well. So how would you, because I know one of the problems that I've seen um, up close is a, what is the word, an adult child caregiver attempting to take care of an advanced stage parent, and they don't have the financial power of attorney. One person, basically between them and their mom, had two homes. And in California, we can pretty much guarantee what that financial resource is like. But they didn't have the authority to sell what? Well, they could sell theirs and move in with mom, but their business was in this city, not the other. I'm trying to keep this very anonymized. <laughs> but it's like, and then they got really bad advice from an elder law attorney. that said, no, 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 you shouldn't sell your mom's house because... That's where elder abuse comes in, elder financial abuse. And I was like, can I get the name of that attorney? Because I think I want to go punch him in the nose. Because this gal <laughs> literally, I mean, she didn't have the money to get help. She didn't have the money. She didn't have money. It just And she was losing her mind. So it was all bad. But it started with her mother's refusal to give her financial power of attorney. So how do you suggest people delicately go about that because that is that is a pretty touchy conversation it's like hey mom dad you know 
I need to be your financial power of attorney. Yeah, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> sure. And of course, every single family's desires look a little bit different. And as a financial advisor, I work very closely. I'm based in Arizona and I have a couple of elder law attorneys that I work very closely with. And there are certain things that they help our clients with and certain things that I help our clients with. I cannot speak enough to the importance of planning ahead. And I know that's not realistic for all of the listeners listening to this podcast. And that's why we not only specialize in pre-planning, but also in crisis planning. So as far as that conversation, the earlier you have that conversation, the more calm the conversation tends to be because everyone is not dealing with the stress of a new dementia diagnosis. So I would say even for kids who are in their late teens, early 20s, having conversations with your parents about what happens if there is a long-term care need that comes up tomorrow, where would you want to receive care or who would you want to provide that to you? And it kicks off that conversation. And, And I wouldn't say in every situation, having an adult child, as the power of attorney may be best. It could be a spouse or a sibling. So I think having those conversations early open up more doors and make sure something important like that is taken care of. Yeah, because that just, I was fortunate. My dad had um, diabetes and he had a kidney donation that he didn't take very good care of. So I showed up at his house 2016, not a good year apparently, and to help put up Christmas decorations for my mom and visit with them and all that good stuff. And he looked at my husband and said, oh, so how's the credit union business treating you? And my husband's like, oh, uh, I haven't been in the credit union business for 13 <laughs> years. Yikes. And because we were friends with his financial planner, so he was like a family friend and also a Rotarian, it was very easy to contact him and and handle things before all the legal stuff was handled. I was the financial power of attorney with my sister. I was the healthcare power of attorney alone. Not really sure why they picked that option, but that's okay. That's the way it worked. But there wasn't, we hadn't had any conversations. I mean, I knew that he wanted to stay in his home forever and died, which he did. And my mom wanted to live forever in her home, but she didn't want to be a burden to my sister and I. Like, okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that doesn't work, lady. You you have you feed the dog every time she looks at you and the dog is about to explode because she's just Aww. so huge. Yeah. A miniature poodle who should have weighed about fifteen pounds. She weighed twenty eight. Oh my. <laughs> yeah, every time the dog wanted attention, the dog got food. So I have a very food motivated golden retriever who's currently upside down on the couch next to me in the office. Her name is Aww. Luna. She's my goofy girl. Um and she would probably be the same way as my mom's dog. If, if I, if I had Alzheimer's, that dog would be that big too, I'm sure. Cause she's very, very food motivated, but we didn't have conversations like, Hey dad, well, what are we going to do with mom? If you pass away first, which should have been a really simple thing to, to mm-hmm. conclude because he wasn't in the sure. best of health, but he never wanted to have those conversations. So apparently we just didn't. And my sister and I got to deal with a lot of crises, but they, they were smart. They planned ahead. Uh, summer of 2020, my husband and I did our estate planning, so we've planned ahead. And I like to tell That's people, cool. it is no big deal. The worst question, and we had to discuss the potential Alzheimer's issues, but the worst mm-hmm. question was, because I also have one daughter, what happens, okay, she's your beneficiary, what happens if she, if she goes first? And I remember looking at the attorney, who was a Rotarian friend of ours, and I said, that's a really lousy question. And I don't have an answer for that right now. And she's been with the same guy for nine years now and they're getting married 2022. So it's all good, but you get into your head with like his family. He grew up very poor. They had a lot of financial struggles. He's got some siblings who don't make great choices and you start over analyzing. Okay. Well, if, she goes first and we just give him the money and then blah, 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 you're just, your brain is spinning a mile a minute. Sure. One, one day my husband said, you know, we never answered that question for the attorney. And I looked at him and I said, we'll be dead. It won't matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one way to look at it. That's what I thought. I'm like, you know what? It's not a big deal. Don't overthink it. And so it's done. Sure. And 
you know, we've discussed it with them. They know what we want and we'll update it every year. And that's, that's all, or we'll at least check on it every year. So this is for those people who think it's expensive. It's hard. It's stressful. It's no, it's no big deal. Really. Just don't overanalyze. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and getting those things done when things are not super stressful, it gives you the time to actually focus on your loved one if there is a diagnosis and they need care. So I can't speak enough to getting those plans in order before there is a is an emergency or a crisis. So for people like myself who have planned ahead, what should we do for those who haven't? Like now we're in a crisis mode. You aren't personal friends with your dad's financial planner because <laughs> I'm sure there was some some gray legalities to what was going on when my dad's memory went to heck all at once. But what should we do when we realize there's a problem and we've realized that we don't have any say on what can happen? Sure. I would say seek out professionals. And there are two professionals that come immediately to mind anytime I'm dealing with a crisis with a family who's dealing with a loved one who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's or any other form of dementia. And that would be a financial advisor as well as an elder law attorney. And not just any financial advisor, elder law attorney, there are a handful of us across the country who do specialize. And there is so much value to working with someone who's special specialized because there are a lot of solutions out there that are little known to most advisors that can help pay for the cost of care, whether you're in an emergency or if it's a plan ahead type of situation. So you've heard my family's story and what prompted me to go into business. And there are others like me across the country who have a heart for those who are going through Alzheimer's and dementia. So depending on where our listeners live, there are resources that I can point to I can work with people in other states as well. So I think finding someone who specializes with Alzheimer's and dementia is key because they know ins and outs of those programs. It's easy to apply for these things yourself online, but when you're dealing with government programs specifically, which often tends to be a solution if it's a crisis situation and a lot of plans have not been made, there are little loopholes that you may not be aware of that could impact your eligibility for some of those government programs. So it's highly important to tap the right individuals to help. And it doesn't have to be expensive. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about my strategy for helping those who are, are planning for Alzheimer's. Okay, so good. I meet with clients completely complimentary. So we sit down or meet virtually for a consultation. I learn what their goals are, whether we're planning ahead or if it's a crisis. And I work with them from start to finish to develop what we call an elder care plan. And this is oftentimes leveraging a local elder law attorney to, to determine step-by-step -step actions that they can take to protect their finances, to make sure there's plenty of money available to pay for care, and that they're also protected from a legal standpoint as well. And all the work that I do as a financial advisor in this situation is completely free to my clients. That's a great first step. How, okay, your your website is linked in the show notes so people can just scroll, scroll down in the little podcast app. You'll find Courtney's website. It's financiallybright.com. Sure is. Okay, yay. <laughs> Try to keep See? it as simple as possible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, unlike me, I've had the longest domain names forever because somebody else has what I want and I'm not, real good with the dot something other than org and I'm not an organization. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> but I, it's, it's been a while since I wrote the show notes. So I'm like, I'm surprised I can remember that with everything that's going on. So once you've met with a financial planner and, or you've got an appointment with a financial planner and, and an elder law attorney, both who mm -hmm. should specialize in dementia care what kind of questions should people be asking? What should they be? What should, what information should they be getting? I think I'm saying that all correctly. I want to make sure that when somebody sits down, cause you know, sometimes we get a little intimidated and we don't sure. ask the questions we need to ask, or we think we got the answers and then we find out that we didn't get what we needed. Now we got to go back and nobody's got time for that. So what question, right. let's start with what questions should they be asking? 
Sure. And we touched on this a little bit toward the beginning of our time together. But I would say the first question that I want to know the answer to is if long term care is needed, where would you want to receive that care? And a lot of people immediately think long term care is synonymous with a nursing facility. And yes, that is one of the places someone could receive long term care. But it's not the only place. And the good news is when you plan ahead, you have far more options than if it's crisis management. So I would say, where would you want to receive care and who would you want to provide that care to you? So again, when planning ahead, we can implement strategies that could actually allow funds to be made available to pay a family caregiver, whether that be a spouse, an adult child, or another loved one who the person with dementia trusts and feels comfortable with. I think those plans need to be circulated with everyone who's involved in the financial picture. And that's something that we highly encourage so that there aren't any bumps in the system and we can keep things moving along smoothly. And then last but not least, how would we pay for this care? So as I mentioned, we specialize in some of the different government programs that are available, whether it be something like Medicaid or even veterans benefits that are available for those who have served. But we also specialize in private pay strategies too. And a lot of people immediately think there's no way I can afford the cost of care. There's no way I have enough saved up. I'm going to have to spend down all of my assets. And believe it or not, there are a lot of strategies that we can place you in that would help pay for the cost of care and leave money for your healthy spouse or leave a legacy for your children if that's something that's meaningful to you, your spouse, or your loved ones. That's Excellent information to get because I know through participating in my Alzheimer's support group, you've got a a wife caring for her her husband, and it gets to the point you know they're in their eighties that she can't do the heavy lifting with him. Sure, you know she can't do it all, and and nobody should try. Let's just get that out there, and they have mm-hmm. to move the spouse into memory care, which is super expensive, but they also have to maintain the house they live in. So that's, I'm encouraged to hear that there's some options for that because we rented out my mom's house, which covered slightly more than half of her care plus her social security. And then the financial planner shifted about $1,500 a month into from my dad's investments into the trust bank account. So everything was covered. If there was a copay at the doctor or she needed new shoes or whatever, she always had plenty of money. And then fortunately we sold the house right at the height of the pandemic. Cause we weren't sure what 2021 was going to look at, look like. If only. <laughs> oh, I know it's like, I get so frustrated. I, I don't get too frustrated because it was a 50 year old house. I had gone in and given it a big cosmetic update when we went rented it out because it needed paint and new carpet and all that nonsense because my dad didn't do any of those things. And then, of course, after the people moved in, we ended up having to replace all the appliances, which that happened when they we did that before they moved in because I knew that was going to happen. Like the oven would die on Thanksgiving because that's what it always happened when my mom lived there. <laughs> And then we had to replace the electrical panel and the HVAC system. Like I had to do all the expensive stuff and my mom had the money for that. And then when we sold the house, it sold for a ridiculous amount of money for a 50 year old house. And now it's worth an even more ridiculous amount of money. (laughs) So That's one thing a lot of people don't think about is if you're caring for a parent, don't necessarily sell the house you know, contact a property manager, real, you know, like somebody like my husband, who's a real estate broker and a property manager, because they can speak on both sides of the fence, so to speak, about renting versus selling. Because obviously rent, a rental income, you get that every month unless something bad happens. And, you know, but when you sell it, you only get a finite amount of money. And when it's gone, you don't have any more assets to use to take care of somebody. So you got to kind of balance that. And he hadn't thought of that. It was a CPA in our Rotary right. Club that said, you should consider renting out your mother-in-law's house. And my husband's like, duh, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> so yeah. it's just, it helps really to talk to professionals and people who are not attached to the situation because they can see things more clearly. 
Okay, so we're going to the financial planner like yourself. We know well, mom, would, mom would really like to live in her house forever, but that is not possible without a 24-hour caregiver, which back right. when my dad was on hospice was over $700 a day. She would have ended up having enough money for that. but Yeah, I didn't it's not necessarily that. an option for everyone, though. No, and one of the things I, I like to comment online about, and, you know, I'd, I'm probably going to bring this up again. I'm probably going to do a podcast where it's just me talking about various things. I just haven't figured out what various things that'll be. <laughs> a lot of people have a very, very negative view of like a memory care community. And my mom being one of them. And the day that my sister and I were moving her in and setting up her room and everything, I wasn't sure we were making the right choice because there was this very tall gentleman there wearing flannel pajamas in the late morning, early afternoon with a stuffed animal shoved down the back of his pants. And it was like, I'd never encountered people with Alzheimer's like him. I'd only dealt with my mom and my grandmother. So my experience was limited and that was not the eye opening experience I was expecting. <laughs> and it just, it was, it was rough. It was a very, very rough day. But my mom had friends in memory care. My mom did activities in memory care that she refused to do with me. So her quality of life was much better in a memory care community than living at home or live, God forbid, living with me. That would have, that would have been the worst choice. <laughs> That's the choice my dad thought we were going to do, though. That's what he was expecting. So we know what they want. We know approximately what their assets are. What should our next steps be? I want people to make sure when they talk to you or any other financial planner that they're asking the right questions. Sure. And I think something else that's important to consider within families is where would we want to receive care? And I don't think even though this may not sound like the most fun activity to do on a Saturday, but I think researching various care facilities in your area and even scheduling some tours. So again, this is something that I live every single day because of my dad's diagnosis and something that we've had a lot of conversations on. But my mom, my brother, and I have already started researching facilities and finding the right time for your loved one to go into a facility is key. And it's very different for every single person. But I think the more you can accomplish when it's not an emergency, the more options you have. And a lot of these facilities have major waiting lists too. So when your loved one truly does need care, if that decision has not been made and you don't know how you're going to pay for it, then you may have to put them in a facility that you've not vetted out or one that you don't feel as good about. So I think the more you can do in advance and meeting with the right professionals is truly key to make sure that you're unlocking resources and maybe leveraging some of your assets to pay for this care to get them where you truly would feel comfortable leaving them at the end of visiting them for a day. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, no, that's a really good idea. And you're right. It's probably not uh, top of the bucket list of things to do with the family on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon. But, you know, no. there's there's a brand new uh, assisted living memory care community just down the street from me. This is in my current Brentwood, California home, not the new house that we're moving into shortly. And <laughs> it's like I record things and release them at such strange times. It's going to sound bizarre. People listening all the time, I'm like, oh, she recorded this one before that one, and we got it. But it's beautiful. And just a side note, oh. my husband was on the planning commission for 10 years, and he approved oh. the design. So we live in a what was a rural agricultural town, and uh -huh. it has a very agricultural feel to it. It's very interesting. So it's not open right now, but it's, it's brand new. It's all, it'll be open, I think, when this comes out, which isn't that far from our recording date, but that's here and are there. And I way back at the very beginning of doing this podcast. So in 2018, I actually talked to a gal that was living in the assisted living part of the community. My mom was in and sh she and her kids had done that. They had looked at different places. And when she walked into the one that she was at, she said she knew that was the right one, which you know, you talk about vetting places. <laughs> this is more for you because most of my listeners should know this, but for those who might be new, I did not vet my mom's place. 
Yes. I did not do like, oh. I did not look for Google reviews. I did not, I didn't know anybody to ask. Like I, I found out sure. later people I knew who was, I just went on gut instinct, which thankfully turned out to be fine. Gut instinct is not always bad, <laughs> but it was yeah. hard because my dad was on hospice. I knew she wasn't coming to live with me because I knew that wasn't going to work out so great. And they had a waiting list. And then when I called and said, you know, my dad's passed away, not sure when to move mom in. They're like, well, we have an opening now. And I'm like, this seems cruel. He just died. And they're like, not going to be any different two weeks or two months from now. And I'm like, you're right. Well, my dad died March 2nd, 2017. And mom got, went to memory care on March 16th, which makes us sound very wow. close. It was rough. Wow. But one of the yeah, one of the things that was hard for my sister, the assisted living dining room, you know, had it looked like a restaurant. And you go over to the memory cares dining room and it looked like a cafeteria. And she's just like, Well, why don't they have any pretty things on their table? And I'm like, uh, probably because they disappear. And there was one gal, she was so cute. She lived there like the first two years my mom lived there. But, oh, my gosh, if that woman could put her eyeballs on it, it was hers. Don't let go of your purse because she would take your purse. <laughs> I mean, and you couldn't really fight with her. And she was this tiny. I mean, I'm only 5'2", and she was shorter than me. So this is saying yeah. something. When I tell you, when I say somebody's tiny, they're tiny. And, you know, <laughs> like there was one day I saw her coming. She eyeballed my purse, and I grabbed it just about the time she grabbed it. And I'm like. No, 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 this one's mine. And I'm literally like, thankfully, I'm, I do work out so I can I pull pretty hard. And I put it behind me. I'm sitting in a chair with my talking to my mom. And I knew to distract her because she was going to throw a fit over me stealing her purse. I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, and yeah. if you go see various places, you'll understand that, you know, yes, it's different. And it may not be as aesthetically pleasing, but it's. It's designed for their safety and comfort and to keep them sure. safe. So don't judge a book right. by its cover because they, they can't make things pretty if it's going to walk out the door. Um, my mom had friends. I told you she had friends. She and this one friend rolled up her brand new area rug and stuffed it in her friend's like, <laughs> oh. I have no idea why they did that. So it's like, yeah, it's it's insane. So what information... Should we be asking an elder law attorney? I know we had to see one because my parents' trust made it very clear that my mom was the beneficiary and the executor of the, the state. If my dad died, mm -hmm. it wasn't real clear at all who was the executor if my mom was incompetent. And we were literally like days away from making a, a court appointment to have her declared incompetent. And my sister contacted an elder care attorney and he, he read through all the paperwork, which neither one of us read very well. And he found where it stated, like it was on page two of my dad's part of the trust. It was like on page 11 on my mom's. It was just like crazy. But thankfully we didn't have to go to court. And I know that's something a lot of people have to do, which is a challenge. Right. Is there a way beside, if you haven't planned ahead, is there a way to avoid that? Might be a really Absolutely. Good and that's definitely more of the scope of an elder law attorney than a financial advisor. But because I work so closely with elder law attorneys, I can speak generically to it. So I think the biggest takeaways would be making sure there is a proper power of attorney in place. And that is something that an elder law attorney should help you with to make sure that all of your I's are dotted, T's are crossed, and then also protecting your assets. So I protect assets from a financial perspective. They do also, but they can help protect it from things like court proceedings when you least want to deal with them. So there are very valuable things that both an elder law attorney and a financial advisor can do when a dementia diagnosis is in place. So again, speaking more to, to my role, we try to determine how does this family pay for care in the most cost-effective tax efficient way possible. And there are so many solutions out there, but again, meeting with the right professionals is going to help you outline what does that plan look like and how can we make your assets or what you have available pay for care in the way that you want? And then how can we protect that as well? Awesome. So what documents do they need to bring to you? I'm sure you tell people when they make their sure. appointment, but mm -hmm. no. If you got to go scrounging around parents' house to find some of these documents, it might be helpful. 
if people know what to like be on the lookout for or what what they should make sure is in their little portfolio of legal paperwork and all that crap we have to keep because life yeah that's a that's a great question so when i'm working with clients i have them complete a basic financial questionnaire so it will ask them different questions about what money they have available so whether this be something that's sitting in a checking or a savings account what investments they have what retirement accounts they have any available assets, those are things that I would want to know about. That way we know how to best leverage them for a long-term care need. A lot of people plan their finances or start saving for their retirement at a young age through their employer. But a lot of people do not consider long-term care planning at all when they're considering their finances. And it's scary to overlook that considering that 72% of us will need some sort of long-term care in our lifetime. I posted something recently on my Instagram page about homeowners insurance, auto insurance. These are kind of a no brainer for us. Like all of us have those things. If we drive a car or own a home, even a lot of apartments have homeowners type insurances that many of us don't have anything in place for a long-term care need. And my dad's a prime example, 58 years old. He still, he still should have been working for another seven years, maybe even more, but his, his work, work time was cut short because of his diagnosis. And there are people far younger than my dad who are being diagnosed. So it's important to have a plan. So coming into an appointment with me, I would just say, make sure you have all of your financial statements ready and available to discuss so that we can look at things from a holistic standpoint. More paperwork to handle. My favorite. <laughs> <laughs> the good news is once you have everything together, it helps keep things more organized moving forward. And you can look at the whole picture of things rather than maybe something slipping your mind that could be a very powerful tool to pay for care. So the form that I give people when they schedule a consultation with me is a really good guide for you to help compile things. It should spark memories of, oh, yeah, I've contributed for a 401k for several years. So I do have something like that or an IRA, maybe a pension, those types of things. So it's a, a pretty holistic document that will help guide them on what they need. Awesome. Now, you wrote a book that just, just became published. That was one of the reasons that we postponed our recording and it will be mm -hmm. available or it should be available on your website when this comes out. So yes. what specific, talk about your book a little bit, because that seems only fair since you've given us so much good advice today already. <laughs> sure. Yes. So my book is called Shining Light on the Truth, Dementia and Your Money. So I have actually partnered with someone who has been in the industry as a financial advisor for close to 40 years. He's based in St. Louis. His name is Don. And he's been a mentor of mine. He is also very passionate about Alzheimer's specifically and has been a huge advocate, speaker, and author. So the two of us collaborated to write this book. And what it's for is helping families, whether it be someone in a crisis or maybe a child. Like you have had a mother who passed away with Alzheimer's. I have a father who's currently dealing with it. So not only crisis situations, but what do people our age do to make sure we have a plan in case that becomes part of our story someday. So it gives all kinds of resources, community-based resources, even illustrates some very high-level financial concepts of solutions that could work to pay for care that are outside of the scope of what many of us might consider. So the bottom line is how do we pay for care in the most tax-efficient, cost-effective way possible without losing all of our money? So there is no reason why any of us should die completely broke. And we want to protect that money, preserve it for the surviving or healthy spouse, and also leave a legacy for children or maybe a, an organization that you love, if that is what your wishes are. So that's a little bit more about the book. And yes, yeah, so it will be available on my website. And by the time you post our chat, I will make sure I have a link to share with you so you can connect it to your audience too. Awesome. That's terrific. Well, I appreciate all this useful information. I, I like to tell people I felt very blessed because I didn't have to worry about my mom and her money. I mean, I did because that's just me, but I didn't have to go through a lot of this crisis planning with the finances. I do other crisis planning, so I cannot imagine what it'd be like to have to do what I did and then add the financial part on top of it. Just it would have put me over the edge because, you know, that's 
I I can only do math if it's got dollar signs in front of it. <laughs> and I like to I like addition and, and multiplication, no subtraction. So that's my joke about math. But you yeah. know, without my husband and the financial planner, it would have been even harder. My dad planned ahead, so it was all good. So I really hope people have gotten the message. It is not painful to plan ahead. It is not expensive to plan ahead. And if mm -hmm. your person that you're caring for didn't, there are solutions. So yeah. make sure to check out Courtney's website. And I think if you guys pay attention to the social media and the, and the podcast feed, I think you're going to find out a little bit more about Courtney personally. So, But you're going to have to tune back in for that one. So thank you so much, Courtney. Yes. Thank you so much for having me, Jennifer. I enjoyed our conversation. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.